Cool, thanks so much. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. As I think Fernando said yesterday, this community is literally the intersection of open source and open science, which are two of my favorite things. Um, so it's so exciting to be here and such an amazing conference. Um, as Fernando uh, also just said, uh, I did recently make a really big jump in my life. Um, uh, up until about a year ago, I was running a neuroscience research lab at this incredible research institute, Genelia. And my lab was focused both on neuroscience research, but also on developing computational tools and software for the analysis of neuroscience data and making all of neuroscience more collaborative. About uh, 10 months ago, I left Genelia to join the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for Science. Um, and here is Corey Bargman, who is the president of Chan Zuckerberg Science, uh, making the announcement. Uh, that so inspired me that I leapt at the opportunity um, to join this incredibly exciting new initiative. Um, so as Fernando said, um, this is an initiative founded by Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, and the goal of our work in science is to support basic science and technology that will make it possible to cure, manage, or prevent all diseases by the end of the century. And if you're sitting there thinking that this is a totally crazy and impossible objective, um, I would probably agree with you. Um, uh, it is uh, really ambitious. Um, what I would ask is to uh, have you think about whether if I said we were going to achieve this in a thousand years, uh, you might think it's more realistic. Um, you know, and that maybe makes sense. Science has done incredible things in the last a thousand years, and it might be possible to do this in the next a thousand. And if you believe that, then the question is really, how do we make a thousand years of progress ten times faster? And for that reason, a lot of what we're thinking about, especially right now at the start of this initiative, is what are tools and technologies that accelerate all of the work that scientists do? What are things that make all of science and all of biology more efficient, more effective, more scalable, and more collaborative? And uh, as everyone in this audience knows, a really important way to, or a really effective way to accelerate a field is through software and computational tools that make the work that everyone is doing um, faster and more effective and more efficient. And that's a lot of the focus of the initiative as a whole, and especially the work that I'm involved in. Um, the fact that, as a philanthropy, we're also involved in actual software development is, I think, one of the most unique and exciting things about this organization. Um, so on the one hand, as a philanthropy, we fund science, the left-hand side of this, um, but we also do open source software development. And a lot of what we're thinking about is how do we do these things together and combine them in a way that maximizes um, the potential impact of our work. So it's been super exciting to get started there at CZI. Again, I've been there for about a year. Um, partly because we're new, we uh, recently did a Reddit Ask Me Anything, uh, which was kind of an unusual and interesting experience. Um, and uh, one of the questions we got early on uh, actually is a pretty good outline for what I wanted to cover in this talk. Um, so during the AMA, uh, Tuvin Stamp said, hey, Jeremy, um, and anyone else, uh, you've been working on open and reproducible science for the last few years. Uh, what are your biggest takeaways? Are the challenges more social or are they technical? Uh, once all scientists are writing Jupyter Notebooks, um, what do we do then? So first of all, I love the idea that all scientists are going to be writing Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I, I think we could get there, and if we do, it'll really be due to the work of uh, everyone in this community and a lot of the people in this room. So that's a super cool ambition. Um, I do think once we get there, uh, there are still some really significant challenges and opportunities um, in this world of sort of open source and open science um, where there are chances to make uh, really big progress and also big problems to solve. And what I wanted to do today was uh, share with you uh, three examples of areas that I've been thinking a lot about in the context of the work I did at Genalia, but also we're thinking a lot about now at CZI in terms of areas where we might have an opportunity um, to make real progress in this space. And the first one, uh, sort of the most fundamental, um, is the basic problem of analyzing data. And the real challenge here to me is that modern biology is just super complicated. Um, the kinds of experiments we do are incredibly complicated. And as an example of that, um, this is the kind of work that I was doing at Genelia. Um, this is an experimental setup where we have a, this mouse on a ball and the, ball, the mouse is running through a tactile virtual reality environment. So she has walls on either side of her and in front of her. And the walls are moving around on little motors to create the experience of walking through a virtual corridor as shown on the right. Now, the reason we're using this virtual environment is that because her uh, body is stationary, we can use this giant microscope on top of her head to watch patterns of brain activity while she explores this virtual environment. 
And we can capture that brain activity in the form of images like this one, or movies, where each of these little tiny flashing lights is the activity or, or represents the activity of a single neuron. So we're simultaneously watching the activity of tens of thousands of neurons while this animal explores an environment. So this is super cool science, but it generates really complicated data. Um, and it's not just the size of the data, though it is large. It's really the complexity. You have these images. You have them vary over space and time. You have behavior. You have all this kind of complicated, heterogeneous stuff that you have to put together to understand the system. So the good news is that we do have a lot of tools that we can use um, to analyze this data and sort of understand it and structure it. Um, one of those tools is Jupiter. Um, and in fact, uh, here's a picture of Nick Safranyev, who led this work in my group. And here he is at the microscope with a Jupiter notebook where he's analyzing the data basically in real time as it comes off the microscope to try to understand what this mouse's brain is doing while it explores this environment. So it's super cool that we have these tools and we can use them. Um, there's really, in this community, an ecosystem of tools um, for analyzing this kinds, these kinds of data. Um, and this is not just sort of neuroscience imaging. Um, microscopy and related tools are really widespread throughout all of biology. And we have this great ecosystem of open source tools that are really powerful for looking at these kinds of data. I think the big challenge right now, especially in this community, is that despite having all of these tools, the actual sort of day-to-day -day experience of your typical biologist is still pretty complicated. Um, so this is a screenshot from uh, a grad student in my group um, who uh, was literally just doing data analysis one day, and I took a, a screen grab. Um, so on his window, Davis has simultaneously open a uh, terminal uh, uh, that's actually connected to a Spark cluster. He has a Jupyter notebook. Um, and then he has a whole bunch of pretty complicated custom microscopy software um, that he needs because it lets him really interactively and really quickly explore his data. So Davis is using all three of these tools. One's running in Python, one's running on the JVM. Actually, two of them are on the JVM. Um, all simultaneously and in a somewhat haphazard way. And this is sort of the current state of the ecosystem. And I think it's really cool that all these tools exist. But there are also huge opportunities in terms of usability and interoperability um, to basically make Davis's life easier so that Davis can spend more time uh, doing experiments and collecting all this incredible data um, and less time sort of turning the crank on the analysis, which right now still occupies a large fraction of his time. Um, so that's something I'm super excited to be thinking about. Um, I think the answer is definitely going to involve Jupiter. Um, it could involve Jupiter Lab, which uh, we've all heard about now and is super exciting. Um, it'll probably be involved new tools as well. And a lot of what we're thinking about at CZI is how do we bring the right people together to build and improve these kinds of technologies. And I think it's really going to be important for this to be a collaboration between the software engineers we have at CZI, but also the biologists that are actually collecting the data, computational scientists that are thinking about sort of what these tools should do, um, and then hopefully the kinds of people in this room that are building incredible tools that support uh, uh, open science and these kinds of novel data analysis applications. That theme of collaboration um, is the second thing I really want to highlight because it's something we're thinking about a lot in terms of how to support better collaboration um, in science as a whole because we think it's a critical way to move science forward and move it forward faster. And we're doing a lot of this thinking in the context of a large-scale science project called the Human Cell Alice. So this is an international effort. Um, it's much bigger uh, than just CZI. CZI is one of, one of many groups trying to support it. Um, it's an effort to systematically characterize all cells in the human body. Now, the reason this is such an important uh, and needed endeavor um, is this amazing thing about biology, which is that in your body, despite every cell having the same DNA, having the same genetic program, every cell ends up doing something totally different. So the neurons in your brain are completely different than the muscle cells in your heart, which are completely different, or rather different, than the muscle cells in your arm. So all cells, same DNA, but they end up doing very different things. And we want to understand and characterize and systematically map the diversity of cells across the entire body. And that's going to require a wide variety of methods, um, including both uh, sequencing, sort of genomic sequencing techniques, um, as well as imaging methods like the one that's being depicted here to show just the incredible rich complexity of cells and how they're organized in tissues. CZI is really excited to support the development of this resource. And we're doing that in a couple different ways, uh, a couple different ways that actually uh, are starting to include Jupyter. So one of those is to build a data coordination platform that can support the hundreds of labs all over the world that are going to be generating all of this really complex and enormous data um, for the purpose of mapping all of these cells. 
And this is a platform we're developing. Again, our software engineers are collaborating with uh, software engineers and computational biologists at three leading research institutes, um, EBI, Broad, and UC Santa Cruz. And we're working together to build a platform that will make it possible for the hundreds of labs all over the world um, ingest data into this system, uh, make that available in cloud storage, and make it widely available, as openly available to as many researchers as possible. We need to analyze all of that data uh, as it comes in and apply standardized, reproducible, um, systematic, well-defined analysis pipelines to the data as it arrives, and then ultimately make it available to everybody else. And I should say, in building this platform and in this project as a whole, we are really building on top of uh, the many great successful large science projects, um, uh, all the way back to the human genome, for example, as well as some really amazing projects in physics. What we're trying to do with this platform is sort of reimagine um, today, I think in, in many ways for the first time, what a modern, cloud-based, open source, uh, very modular, extensible version of this kind of data coordination platform would look like. And we're super excited to be developing it. Um, and we're also really excited by the fact that Jupyter um, is starting to emerge as a really important player in terms of how people are going to be accessing this data in the cloud and interactively exploring it and analyzing it. So a lot of the groups we're working with to build this are really excited about Jupyter uh, essentially as a front end for this platform, and we're really excited to, to support those use cases. Um, Jupyter's also shown up uh, because in figuring out which analyses to run on these data, that green box at the top, uh, we really need the entire computational community to be working together and developing new analysis algorithms and figuring out which analysis algorithms are the best. And a really great way to do that is to bring communities together through things like hackathons. Uh, and we recently hosted one where we used JupyterHub uh, to make it super easy for everybody at this hackathon to be working together in the same computational environment, to be iterating on hard computational problems in both genom genomic and imaging data analysis, um, and working together. So you've already heard a bunch of examples of how awesome Jupyter Hub is. Uh, let this be another one. Um, but I really want to stress, this is changing the way that we can organize and run uh, this kind of event. And it's a super exciting uh, use case for me. That's a good segue into the final topic I want to touch on, um, which is, is sharing knowledge much more generally. Um, and this is something that's been near to, dear to my heart for quite some time. Uh, the fundamental challenge here is that uh, science right now, in general, um, and this, this should not be a surprise to anyone here, um, shares knowledge in a, in a pretty old-fashioned way. Um, so we're using a technology to share science that uh, you could argue was invented by Isaac Newton, um, which is that we put all the science we do into static documents um, that were designed for paper, and we share them with each other. Uh, before we do that, we send them to journals, and it takes about a year, or often much longer, um, before we're able to share them, and then people have to pay for them to get access. Um, these documents that we share, they don't have data, they don't have code, they're not interactive, they're not reproducible. Um, and you know, this is a, a huge opportunity to really change the way um, and sort of modernize the way that we share the science we're doing and make it easier to work together. So certainly everybody in this room is thinking, um, you know, why isn't something like the Jupyter Notebook uh, the format that we use for papers? And that's something we're definitely really excited about. Um, whether Jupyter Notebooks ultimately, um, because of their interactivity and their ability to combine data and analysis, they could either complement papers or maybe someday um, even replace them. I think that's a really exciting vision. And actually, someone I worked on um, in my group at Genalia, and really Andrew Oshroff was the person on my team leading this effort, um, we worked on some tools to make it easier, much easier for scientists to package up their data and their code um, and put it together with Jupyter Notebooks in a form that was really easy for anyone else to get access to. Um, and that was a project called Binder um, that maybe some of you have heard of um, at mybinder.org. Um, and this is something uh, that was basically inspired by a night that I went out uh, with beers for Fern with Fernando and Matias um, to come up with this concept. Uh, we built it really just as a prototype, and it sort of took off way more than we expected, um, which is often how these things happen. Um, so it quickly sort of outgrew its capabilities, um, and I'm really excited uh, to be telling you today that uh, Binder has now more or less been uh, sort of adopted by the Jupyter Hub team. Um, and really thanks to the incredible work of Chris Holgraf and UV Panda, um, the support and work of Fernando Perez and many others, 
Um, Binder is now being essentially rebuilt to run on top of Jupyter Hub, um, and the new version is going to be much more scalable and robust um, and, and, and freely available. That's very much the goal. Um, you can check it out at beta.mybinder.org, and I'm super excited about this happening, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way for the project to evolve. Um, the last thing I want to highlight is uh, touches on not just the technical aspects of how we share knowledge, which are super important, um, but also the social ones. And uh, on the topic of, of social uh, sort of challenges to sharing, um, a big issue is just making it easier and sort of more acceptable for scientists to share more of their work earlier and often. And for the physicists in the room, um, the idea of working through these journal systems uh, is kind of crazy because you all know about Archive, which has been around for about 20 years. Uh, and the idea of Archive is that instead of uh, going through this whole process of uh, submission and waiting for a paper to be accepted, you just post it to the internet and then anyone can read it for free as soon as you finish your work. Um, so this is awesome. Uh, it took a really long time for biology to get uh, sort of get this model, um, but it has recently through something called BioArchive, which essentially enables the same thing for the biology community. Um, and just in the last couple years, thanks to BioArchive and its leaders, um, but also thanks to the work of advocacy groups like ASAP Bio, this has really taken off in biology, which we're super excited about. Um, and one of the very first things uh, uh, that we did at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was uh, put support behind BioArchive and really is an illustration of, of our approach to, to many problems. We did this in two ways. We uh, have given a grant to support uh, the team behind BioArchive, help it grow, help it scale, help their existing services, but we're also gonna be doing software development in the open collaboratively with them to build new tools and new features and new functionality to the service that we view as really critical um, and a super exciting movement within biology right now. And one of those things, uh, among many, could be and hopefully will be uh, finding cool ways to incorporate Jupyter Notebooks into the way that scientists are sharing their work uh, early in the scientific process on BioArchive. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all so much and thank this amazing community for such an awesome conference, and thanks to Fernando and Andrew, um, and I'll see you all around today. <laughs>